Everybody say, thank God for wisdom. But what is wisdom? Wisdom is what we do now to prepare for tomorrow. It's what we do right now to get ready for God's best that's yet to come. Because if you're not ready, it's going to pass you right by. And we don't want that to happen. Amen? All right. We've been studying about the buffet zone and uh, how to break through that buffet zone. So this is part of that. Uh, interesting thing happened. Uh, some of you have already heard, you know, seen it on Facebook. Uh, on last Sunday, we flew out of Baton Rouge on our way to California. We were going to meet with some men, and, uh, and we did. And I tell you, those meetings were fantastic. They really were. We, we learned a lot, a lot we didn't really want to know, but uh, because there were so many problems going on in some of these guys' churches, and, you know, one guy lost his whole staff, and uh, one guy lost about half of his church because of the, because of some some <laughs> some rebellion going on within the ranks that he didn't see coming and uh, no covering, no, nothing to help them there, uh, and you see that a lot. And then another guy, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about his story in a, in a little bit, but uh, he had a guest ministry come in and and uh, lost some people out of his church because of what the guy brought to the pulpit. And uh, you know these things ought not be so, amen. We should come to church, hear the word of the Lord, get equipped, get ready to roll. And, uh, and that's not happening everywhere. Now, we un- I understand we're just talking about a few meetings that we had. Uh, but, you know, it just grieves your spirit because God is greater than all that mess. But it still goes on. you got so much of this self-proclaimed, self, I'm, I'm this, I'm that stuff going on now. I mean, you're nothing unless God gives you that opportunity. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and we see it, and we, we, we are recognizing that. So anyway, uh, this is part of what we're dealing with. Now, also, we got there, we arrived late uh, on Sunday evening. We, were, we, were, uh, we left out after church. Uh, we got there, we were tired, we uh, had a reservation. We stayed in Los Angeles because we flew into LAX, Los Angeles Airport. And uh, tired, you know, got to bed uh, late. Uh, how many of you know that they're, they're two hours behind us? And so, you know, our normal time to get up, when my body says it's time to get up, well, you know, it's called jet lag. I mean, it's like 5 o'clock in the morning there, you know, and, and you know, it's like <laughs> 4, 30, 5 o'clock, and I'm rousing up because that's 6, 6, 6, 30 here. So anyway, uh, I got up and, uh, you know, couldn't sleep anymore, and so, so I got up, and it's still dark outside, and I'm sitting at my computer, and I'm checking emails because they started coming in, you know, and, and get about 140 or 50 a day. And uh, so I just started looking through them. And, and uh, about 625, some of you might have seen on the news, they had an earthquake. Now, you know, if you've never been in one of those, anybody here ever been in an earthquake before? Uh, you know, they don't happen down here. We're not calm. That's, that's not something that we know how to deal with. And, uh, but I'm going to use this kind of as a takeoff for what I'm about to preach to you because of the way it happened. Um, and so here we are, and about 625, I'm looking at my, at my emails, and, and it sounded like thunder outside. It sounded like, you know, how thunder just rolled. Now, we're familiar with thunder, right? So my mind immediately started interpreting, man, it's going to rain today? I know it's supposed to rain today, and I'm hearing this going on for about 10 seconds. It's just rumbling like that, and then all of a sudden, rumbling got a little louder, and it hit the building. And it sounded like a bomb went off inside the building. I mean, just this crash, this boom, I mean, just unbelievable but, but at the same time the boom happened, the building just shook. And I mean, I came up out of my chair and things are, things are moving around that's not supposed to be moving. Jody sits up in the bed and she goes, it's an earthquake. <laughs> I said, you think? <laughs> so what's my point? Well, you know, when the building got rocked like that, you know, my mind was thinking, okay, how many of you know that whenever you're familiar with something, you know, and and you're just kind of, everything's okay, but all of a sudden, bam, the unexpected happens. You didn't expect it. How many of you know that's the time when you're in the buffet zone? Now, what am I saying all that for? How many of you know the scripture where it says God didn't speak through the earthquake? Come on now. Or the storm. What did he speak through? Still, small voice. And so my mind immediately goes, now, that wasn't a thunderstorm. I'm, I'm falling around in the building here. The building's shaking. Jody's screaming. Uh, she's not screaming, but she's saying, you know, earthquake. And going, she goes, what do we do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Come on now. You see, a- and so my mind is in high gear. How many of you know what I'm talking about? All right. When, whenever things happen in life it, that we don't expect, it, we automatically launch into 
what do we do? Spiritually speaking, you know, well, we pray. Well, you know, the first thing I thought about was getting out of the building. Because in my mind, I said, well, we got 16 floors above us. I certainly don't want to be under all of that. You know, earthquake now, I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm about to hit the panic button, right? And I see people running for the lobby, and I told Jody, I said, get up, get dressed, let's go. And she goes, my hair's not done. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I'm in survival mode here, man. I don't, I've never been anything like that. And they, of course, they said it was the strongest they've had in 20 years. And, and the experience of it was, was just amazing because it just, but uh, you could hear it just rolling off in the distance. And, and so we got up and she got up and we got, you know, ready. We launched out to the lobby. By the time we got there, it's all over. Well, everybody that's used to that, they were like, oh, it's done now. All you're going to have is just the aftershocks and all that. And I'm like, I don't like that. You know, well, how big, I want to know how big is an aftershock. I want to know what to expect, amen? But my point is this. You see, it wasn't God that m made me push the panic button. That still small voice is what you got to look for, amen? That's how you get through the buffet zone. And you've got to be ready when the unexpected happens. And that's my whole point. I'm just using that as an illustration of understanding when things get out of whack really quick, the first thing we do is depend on our own understanding, all right? And I thought it was about to rain. I thought there was thunder coming. Then all of a sudden, it wasn't that. That's where the devil really traps people when they don't expect something. And that's what we are calling the buffet zone. Everybody say the buffet zone. All right, so now you kind of got my, my the, where we're going with this. Now, we're going to read here what Paul talked about, and then we'll get into the meat of the message. In the buffet zone, we're using Paul's writing in the church at the Corinthians. And, uh, and we're starting in chapter 12, and we're going to read about a few verses here. I'm going to start in verse 7, and he said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Everybody say the abundance of revelation. Now, that's something I want you to pay attention to. Because I'm going to do it again today. I'm going to ask you what revelations you may have. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Two things right there I want you to look at. First of all, a thorn in the flesh. We automatically and tradition has taught us that what God was or what Paul was saying by the Holy Spirit was that he was being punished so that he could keep his ego from getting out of control, that God was doing this. Are you with me? You know, there was given to me, because it's written in the Bible, we're thinking God gave Paul something. And tradition picked up on that, and they started trying to make all this fabricated junk about what Paul, it must have been an eye disease because Paul had to have someone write a letter for him. It must have been this. It must have been that. And so we begin to assume, now Paul in the flesh, of course, had to deal with the curse like anyone else. But you understand, that was a, an Old Testament quote. In the Old Testament, when man or when God's people would come up against an adversary or something that, was, that they could not do on their own, they would call it a thorn in the flesh. In other words, you know, I've gone as far as my limit can take me. I'm, I don't have the strength to do this. I don't have the power to do this. Are you with me? And so they knew that with God all things are possible. They, even though it hadn't been written yet, they believed that God was an all-powerful, almighty God. Come on, can somebody say amen? Now, we believe that, don't we? All right? And so, so when they would encounter something like that in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, well, they would call it a thorn in the flesh because it was the flesh that was weak, but the Spirit is always willing. We want to see the supernatural whenever we encounter something my flesh can't endure. Are you with me? All right, Whether, no matter what it may be. And so the second thing is, it says the messenger, it says the thorn in the flesh was what? It was something supernatural, but it wasn't God. Do you see in here where it says God did anything? Does your Bible say that God did this or God caused this? Don't raise your hand, but how many of you have been taught that this was a God thing? You see? And it says nothing like that in the Bible. And so we've been getting these messages, new level, new devil stuff and all that, out of things like this. And then Paul said again, this messenger of Satan, so that I would 
not be exalted above measure. Now I ask you a question right here. What is the, do you have any idea what Satan fears the most? You have any idea what Satan, you, you say Satan fears, oh yeah, he is the, the biggest scaredy cat in the whole universe. We don't look at him like that, but he is, he is a, I mean, he is fear. <laughs> Why? Because that's his nature. That's what he is. Ever since he was separated from God, he became the most fearful creature in existence. Are you with me? He is afraid of everything. Now, what was he afraid of here? Why did he send a spokesperson? <laughs> Why did he send someone else against Paul? Because Paul was getting something supernatural. He was learning how to apply faith. He was learning how to grow in the kingdom of God. And so Satan said, I've got to stop him because if he understands this and gets other people on board with him, my day is done. Are you listening to me? Why does Satan attack? Because he understands that when a person understands their relationship with Christ and knows who they are and begins to get this revelation on the inside of them and they begin to rise up, all right, and, and walk by faith. He knows he cannot stop them. He knows that. And the devil fears that more than anything. Why? Because he wants to control this world. He knows he's going to hell. He knows God cannot lie. He knows where his future is. But he said, between now and then, I'm going to do as much damage to what God says is his and to what God wants to bring forth than anything else in the world. He said, I got to stop this from happening. Otherwise, I don't have much ground to stand on. Now, I don't want him standing on my ground, amen? I don't want him standing on my promises and keeping me back from them. I don't want him standing between me and my victory. I want to have all of the inheritance that God said I could have. And that's my desire, and it ought to be yours too, amen? Why? Because that's what brings glory to God. How many of you want to bring glory to God? Well, we have been given not a thorn in the flesh, not a messenger of Satan. We've been given the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been given the name of Jesus Christ. We've been given the power of Jesus Christ. We've been given the covenant of Jesus Christ. We've been given the opportunity to exist in Jesus Christ because he said, the same things I do shall you do also. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you'll do them also. But you got to be trained. So you see here, the point being, the messenger of Satan was for one reason, not because Paul was about to get this big ego trip, but because Paul had potential to overcome everything the devil would throw at him. Now, we'll talk about that in a minute. For this thing I sought, besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, we need to grab that revelation. How many of you understand that it's by grace I'm saved? It's by grace I do what I do. It's by grace you do what you do. All right? I don't have to put a name or a title on myself. What I do is I simply ask God for more grace, more wisdom to carry out his plan. All right? Because he's the one in charge. Now watch. And, and I say all that because of some of the things we heard this past week have been, it's, it's astounding. It, it just, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. What, 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 let me say this before I move on so that you don't get, <laughs> I'm not going to call any names about the things that we heard that we know for fact and we know this truth. But I'll tell you this, keep your eyes on the Lord. Because a lot of what we see going on on the, on the airwaves and the big ministries that are happening, they've got so much stuff going on, it, it's unbelievable. It really is. It, it ought not be so, church. Come on, somebody. Now, I want to say that. Just keep your eyes on the Lord. Why? Because the day's ahead. There's no way these things can be done and there not be some, <laughs> some corresponding action. That there should, there, There's going to be some things shaking in the body of Christ. I know it because it just can't be like that. It can't continue like that. I'm talking about affairs. I'm talking about stealing. I'm talking about all kinds of things. And, it, and it's, tr it's proven. I mean, it's truth. We, we talk to people who are in close contact and trying to help these guys get out of this stuff. All right. My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, I want to say this. Satan can only defeat the flesh. Do you understand what I just said? 
His attack is always going to put pressure on the flesh. Cause me not to sleep. Cause me to get out of balance. Cause me to not be a good steward. Cause me to get worried. Cause me to do these things. All that natural, amen? When we know God is greater, how many of you know God is greater than all those things that put pressure on my soul? We got to know that, all right? And so he said, therefore, I glory in my infirmities or weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in these infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, first thing I want to do is uh, to define what we're talking about. In order to overcome a buffet zone, in order to overcome those things, I must have a revelation. Now, a revelation is spiritual understanding. I have the definitions of why we're talking about these three things this last couple of weeks. What is a revelation? Spiritual understanding that's obtained through the wisdom of Christ, our Lord Jesus, to establish your calling and receive his full inheritance. You can find that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, 18, 19, 20. You'll find those, those truths right there. But a revelation, Paul said, that God has given to me a spirit of wisdom by revealing to me the knowledge of Christ that I may overcome and understand. The eyes of my understanding, that's the revelation. You see, it's not just doctrine. What I want to talk to you today, first of all, is how to move from your doctrine into revelation. Just because you know what the Bible says does not mean you have a revelation. Are you understanding what I just said? Just because you can quote a scripture and you can do the seven steps you've been taught does not mean that you have a revelation. A revelation is spiritual understanding. All right? It's the understanding of I know my doctrine, but what must I do? All right? I, I must learn that whenever an earthquake hits, a tsunami hits, and my emotions get out of whack and I don't know what to do, I must learn that the Lord will speak in that still small voice. Jody asked me in that case, she said, were you scared? I said, I didn't have time to get scared. It only lasted about 15 or 20 seconds at the most, you know. But my, I was immediately looking how Rocky was going to overcome this, how I was going to get my wife out of harm's way, how I was going to get this stuff. And I didn't really have time to get scared until after it was all over, all right? And then I heard something inside of me. It was a still, small voice. And he said, no weapon formed against you can prosper. Oh, wow. (laughs) I wish I'd have heard that in the time that that building felt like it was about to fall down. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? That's how quick you find yourself in harm's way in a buffet zone, all right? Revelation must be acquired before. It's wisdom. Revelation has to do with understanding how to respond to the future because God knows how many of you believe God knows what's coming how many of you believe God knows what's coming how many of you believe God knows what's coming all right we have to have revelation now to move from doctrine to revelation it takes some effort on our part what we do is we do a few things first of all we have to study to show ourselves that we're ready and approved amen we have to understand what we're studying so we meditate on the word of God we study, we meditate. What does it mean? It means we contemplate, we look at it, we, 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 we don't just look at the doctrine of it, we, we meditate on it. It must work. Everybody say it must work. If you have revelation, it must produce the wisdom of God. Are you listening? Your doctrine won't do that for you because your doctrine is head knowledge, revelation is heart knowledge. I said your doctrine is head knowledge, your revelation is heart knowledge. All right, so so here's that, and then that moves you immediately into step two, which is a revolution, a sudden radical and complete change to overcome a ruler. That's what a revolution is by definition. And so when I have revelation, immediately something clicks on the inside, and I begin to look at the devil for what he is and look at God for what he is and look at my faith and say, this is what I believe. And I will not allow anything to rule over me that is not of what God said. Are you listening? Now, when I have a revelation, I'm going to have this sudden, radical, complete change. I'm going to believe beyond my flesh. I'm going to believe beyond my circumstances. I'm going to believe beyond what man says. 
Come on, somebody. I'm trying to help you here. You see, one of the things that we are, we are too blocked, we're just stuck in the body of Christ in our generation is because we have accepted the lower standard of religion. And we blame everything on God. <laughs> revival. When I make this sudden radical change, I am entering into personal revival. Not just church revival, the definition we've all learned, but personal revival. Why? Because I've got a discerning in my heart, a belief in my heart. I believe the Word of God. I can use this Word of God. I can claim my inheritance. I will make that change, that revolution. I will make my faith, I will have strong conviction that God's word is above every other word or circumstance. I enter into that revival. Why? Because it's at that moment I'm going to see the works of Christ being done. I'm going to gain confidence because I am understanding that he is the one doing the work and he is using me as his vessel to carry that out. Are you with me? Now Paul said, that there was given him a thorn in the flesh. He found a weakness in his, in his natural man. He was dealing with a spiritual being, an entity, a demon spirit. And he called it a buffeting. It was sent to buffet, not to dwell in him, not to rule over him, but it aggravated the stew out of him. Now, what is the buffet zone? Next slide. We're going to get through these and we'll finish it up. A buffet zone is a spiritual barrier. Everybody say spiritual barrier. All right, it's not the natural. You see, what we do is we see the mountain. How many of you know that God knows the mountain is there? How many of you understand that you don't have to talk to God about the mountain? What did Jesus say to do? He said, talk to the mountain about your God. He didn't say talk to the mountain. He didn't say talk to God about the mountain, which is what we think prayer is. Jesus said, as a believer with a revelation in your heart and a revolution stirring in your soul, and you want revival, you speak to the mountain, not to God. Is this making sense to you? You understand, we're talking about a spiritual barrier that appears in the natural. All right? That is intended to limit your ability to exercise your faith and fulfill the revelations that you have in Christ. This is the area, the buffet zone, that you will test your faith against any and all resistance. But I've got to have that revelation. I've got to have spiritual understanding. I've got to know how to apply this word. Why? Because faith comes how? By hearing the word. There's so many of us that have heard so much word. Come on, you know way more word than many people that's ever been in the dark in the doors of a church building. Why aren't we seeing the results? Because we let it stay in doctrine. We don't meditate in the word. We don't have that desire to fight against it and say, wait, this does not glorify God. When this word is applied in our lives, it will bring glory and honor to God. So I will test my faith. God's not putting that there to test me. But something resistance to try to steal, kill, or destroy what God has revealed about his promises. 1 John 2.16 I have as a reference for you. It's where it says you shall overcome the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three main areas that we deal with in our faith. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. All right? And so we have to resist the temptation to go in any of those directions. Now Paul is giving us something here. I said earlier, Satan can only defeat the flesh. He cannot defeat God. He cannot defeat Jesus. He cannot defeat faith. He cannot. Why? Well, how many of you remember our question? We changed them up last week, but how many of you remember our question? Our questions were, what does Satan know about God that we're supposed to? He knows that God cannot lie. What does Satan know about Christ that we say we believe? That Christ is alive. What do we say that, uh, that, that Satan knows about you? Well, that's the unknown. Why? Because he studied your life just like he did Paul. When you come out as a Christian and you say, well, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord, then all of a sudden you become a, an enemy. You become a potential candidate to overthrow his ways and his kingdom. We talked about the temptations of Christ, how that the Satan took Jesus up 
He was led of the Spirit, not by his own doing, but into the wilderness. He was tempted against the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. What do we learn from that? We learn the spiritual thing that Satan does not know. What was it? Satan did not know who was in that body. He knew Jesus Christ, the spiritual Christ. He knew him because he had seen him in the heavenly realm before he got booted out. How many of you understand that? But what did he tell Jesus? If you are. Satan cannot see your heart. He cannot see what you believe. He cannot see what's going on in here. Yet we say Christ dwells in me. How many of you have that revelation that Christ dwells in your heart? All right, now, if that's not just your doctrine, you need to get up and start doing something about it. Because if Christ is in here, I let him out of here right here. If Christ is in here, the way that he comes out here is right here. What do we do? God, that's a big mountain. <laughs> Buffett zone. Buffett zone. He'll make it look as big as you'll allow him to. Any problem you could ever face. How do we move from doctrine to revelation? How do we do this? Well, we move from faith to fact. It must be a manifestation. Revelation will always cause a manifestation in the natural. We must have the next step, and that is when I get this, I begin to engage faith, and I, I consider it done when I can say it with full faith. Come on, I don't need any other outside help. I know what the Word of God says. I've meditated on it. I desire that to happen, and I'm moving forward. Amen? Now, what I'm telling you today is, you, you, we, we got to move into that place. How do I know that I'm moving beyond doctrine and I have revelation? Because I move from passive to passionate. I move from passive to passionate. That's how I know I've got revelation. Why? Because it's no longer about me. The attack is not about me. The attack is about Jesus Christ whom I claim as my Lord and Savior. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? When I can move into passion, all of a sudden, I have something inside of me that says, devil, you are not going to de destroy the work of God. You are not going to keep me from having the inheritance that Jesus Christ purchased with his blood. You are not going to do it. You got to get passionate about it. You got to get something down here that stirs in your soul. That's when you know you've got revelation because you get passionate. You get a sudden change. You begin to talk different. You don't talk anymore about the mountain. You don't talk anymore about that. You look at your life. You examine it. You say, well, how did the enemy get this done anyway? How did he come in anyway? And you begin to look at what things you're not doing that God requires of you. Anytime someone comes to me and they say they have financial problems, all you got to do is look at their giving. Oh, we don't like that. But it's true. Anytime someone has health issues, all you got to do is look at their stewardship. Come on now. Mm. Listen to what they're saying. You'll find out where these problems are at. I'm preaching to you this morning. Because you need to hear this. Why? Because once you have heard it, you've got the responsibility to do something. You can deny it. You can say it ain't so. You can say he's crazy. You can do whatever, but I know this works. <laughs> All right? And we've proven it out. Now, so Paul here is helping us with that to move into that revival. That's where my, all of a sudden, Jesus isn't just some iconic figure that lived 2018 years ago or was born 2018 years ago. He is now a figure that dwells in my heart. I, I believe that. How many of you believe Christ dwells in your heart? All right, now, now, now I got you where I want you to be. All right, so let's find out. Paul had this not because he went up into heaven. Paul had this thorn in the flesh for one reason, and he tells you why. All right, messenger of Satan, because of what? The abundance of revelation. Now, the word abundance, I wrote it down for you, in, in, this, in the language it was translated from, means to exceed the norm or tradition. To exceed the norm or tradition. So, 
We asked you last week, what did the church not know when Paul began to write? How many of you understand that when these things were being written, the church didn't know them? What did they know? They knew Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They knew Jesus Christ shed his blood. They knew Jesus Christ raised to life. They believed that. There were many witnesses that saw him after the resurrection. The, the, the revival began to spread like wildfire. Are you listening? They knew that, but what they didn't know was now that I am a believer and I have received the revelation that Jesus Christ is alive then all of a sudden, what do you do when problems happen? How many of us go and say, Father God, you know, why is this happening? Why did this happen? Why did this go on? Look at your neighbor and tell them, Buffett's on. Because you announced publicly and out loud that I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord because he lives. And the devil says, I can't, look, i got to get them to believe that all they can do is just wait to go to heaven now. Mm, 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 mm. Buffett's on. He's going to try to stop you every time. Now, how many of you got the revelation that Jesus Christ, let's do an altar call. You believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a sinner's death, shed blood sufficient to forgive the sins of every human that will ever be born or ever has been born. Come on, somebody. And that he was put to death, and three days later he arose. How many of you believe that? There's my altar call. All right. <laughs> if you don't understand the buffet zone by now, that is the entry revelation into the kingdom of God. And if you really believe that, it's not just your doctrine, then there is one that made a home on the inside of you that no demon, no devil, no new level can stop. But you better know what you're doing and you better have a revelation that produces a revolution that is going to lead to personal revival because if you don't, you're stuck. And I've been stuck before. Now, Paul had this given because of abundance of revelation. What did the church not know? They didn't know these things. What things? Well, let me ask you a few of them. How many of you believe that you can do all things through Christ? Now, is that your doctrine or is that your revelation? <laughs> well, then, why do we start asking why? Why do we say God's doing something? Why do we do those things? Because it's our doctrine. Either I can do or it's up to God of what I can do. <laughs> That's where religion kicks in. How many of you believe that I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might? That's what the Bible says. How many of you believe that I am a new creature? Oh, I love all the, you know, little fluffy sayings. You know, I'm a new creature with new features and all that. That's all wonderful. But have old things passed away? Come on now, I'm challenging you now. Y'all getting quiet on me. Now that's when you ought to be saying amen. Amen, Pastor Preacher! You know why we get quiet? Because you're thinking. Am I a new creature? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. All, 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 all things. Do I believe that? Is it my doctrine or revelation? So you've got to ask yourself. The church had no idea of these things until Paul experienced them. Why did Paul write these things? Because he understood. <laughs> Paul was just one of those guys that said, man, <laughs> it either God is or God ain't. All right. How many of you believe all things work together in the good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose? Now, religion says, well, you know, God just makes bad things happen so that he can get some good out of it. Boy, that's ignorance gone crazy. But, you know, Paul did say, let the ignorant be ignorant still. Why? Because that's the safest place you can be. You'd be better off not knowing anything than knowing a little bit. We've got so much revelation in here. How many of you believe that <coughs> Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection? How many of you believe that you have no knowledge of the power of his resurrection? Paul said, I want to know him. He said, every day, every day, every tick of the clock. 
How many of you know that you have been given an inheritance? Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 real quick. See, I've got a question. Is this my doctrine or is this a revelation? Now, now let me say this. One of the pastors that we met with, one of the meetings we were in, and by the way, what we're doing, is we got, we got vision for our missions going forward. Man, I mean, the Lord spoke to Jody and I. And, and man, I wrote down that vision. I'm going to be, I'm going to, when I get it nice and done, I'm going to show it to you. Uh, man, we've got work to do. I'm excited about it on the mission field, not only here, but abroad. Uh, it, it's exciting. It really is. We're making contacts that are making contacts. And, and uh, man, I'm telling you, there's some good stuff coming. All right. Because God's involved with it. Now, uh, let me say this. This one man that we met with, one of the meetings, uh, uh, I love the guys. That he's a real humble guy. I really enjoyed meeting with him and his wife. Jody and I did, and uh, meeting in this thing. And he had a he had a ministry come in. Now I, I forget. I'm gonna just say the name because some of you probably seen the video. <laughs> Katy Perry. How many of you know who Katy Perry is? How many of you seen the video of her swing? I think swinging in on a vine with nothing on, but just a couple of little pasties over her private parts and nothing much down there else. I'm not trying to get graphic with you, but if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Well, her parents are evangelists. And they were invited to this man's church. And for an hour and a half, they said this man showed his, his daughter's videos. He's so proud of her swinging in half naked, well, almost all the way naked. People got up and left his church. Now, I have a point to telling you this. People got up, and, and, they, and so we're, we're meeting with him on Tuesday, I believe it was. And uh, yeah, Tuesday. And we're meeting with him and his wife on Tuesday. And he said, man, he said, people got up and left my church. I said, well, here, pastor, didn't you know he was going to show that? He said, man, I had no idea. He just did here. We're in the service and here it comes. And people got up and started leaving his church. And he said, then when they tried to follow up on that, he said, the comments were on Monday, you know, they find, man, you know, we're sorry and all this. And they said, man, that's not church. Everybody say, that's not church. Well, let me ask you a question. What is church? Why does it take something of that level of extremity for us before we start saying that's not church? Why don't we say it's not church when the sick come in and they leave sick? Why aren't we saying that's not church when the poor come in and they leave without provision? Why aren't we saying that's not church when people come in bound up and they, they stay bound up? Why aren't we saying that? Why do we have to wait until we see something like that detestable and then we go, oh, that's not church? Why aren't we saying that's not church when Jesus said, I'll build my church upon the rock of revelation of who I am and the gates of hell shall not prevail? Why aren't we saying that's not church when the gates of hell are still causing the children of God to not receive their inheritance? Because we've not moved beyond doctrine into revelation that causes a revolution. Why? Because when you have a sickness trying to attack your body, what ought to happen is I've got revelation that by his stripes I was healed. And if I was healed, I am healed. And if I am healed and bless God, devil, you better take your symptom, pack your bags, and move on. But you've got to have a conviction that caused a revolution in your life to say this is not of God. Why aren't we saying that? I'm trying to get you to move from a doctrine to revelation. You need to meditate on that word. You need to look at where your weaknesses are. What causes you to fear? What causes you to worry? That's what you need to be meditating in that word, finding out what God says. Why? Because those things are probably going to be in that buffet zone of your life. As you turn to Ephesians chapter 1, I need to finish up. I got five minutes. I'm stirred up. I'm going to tell you why, man. I, have, I am hearing things that are just not supposed to be so. It just, it's a shame. It's a shame that these things are even talked about. It really is. I mean, how far do we have to go to? You know why we're not saying that the sick are not? You, you, you know why we don't know what church is supposed to be? Because we hadn't been in it yet. We've got a lot of hero worship. We bring in a big name and the church fills up. We get excited. What's that all about? Come on, somebody. I mean, we've got to look at inside of ourselves and say, listen, is Christ in here or not? Now, let me tell you what the devil doesn't know. He doesn't know if he's really in there or not. He hears your doctrine. But you've got to have revolution to back up that doctrine if you want revival. Revival is that renewed 
understanding, man, this is who I am in Christ. 133 times in the New Testament, Paul wrote about these revelations that you and I have been taught over and over again. Who I am in Christ, what I have in Christ, what is Christ, who is Christ, where am I, where is he? Come on, we know that, right? It's time to start living it out. Why? Because God's best is yet to come. Now, I'm preaching to you probably like an evangelist. Some of you don't like that, whatever. But here's what I'm going to tell you today. God is waiting on us. He's waiting. I'm telling you, he's waiting. I know it. At Ephesians chapter 1, it says this. Let me get through this very quickly. You can start reading verses 17 all the way down through the end of that chapter. The church is Christ's body. That's what it says in verse 23. It says up here that in 17, Paul making a prayer, you know, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ giving you the spirit of wisdom by revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding, everybody say revelation, will be enlightened, that you may know. See, that's where your faith comes in. Faith knows. Revelation is when I know something. Doctrine is when I believe something. <laughs> Isn't faith believing? Yeah, it is, it is, but you've got to believe you know, all right? And so don't need any other supply, just the word. And then he says that you'll know the hope of his calling. Why am I, what, what's going on? God has called you. Listen, God had to allow the thorn in the flesh. There's no doubt about that. No one will argue that. But it wasn't because of new level, new devil theology. What it was was God said, okay, I'm going to strengthen Paul. You see, when I have his grace, I have his strength. When I understand his grace, I am understanding that now I am strong. I'm learning God's grace. Every time Paul got a revelation that we have the abundance of now, we should be getting stronger. But you're going to have to understand grace is sufficient for you now to understand. God has left you here on this earth so you could overcome the ruler of this world and all of his demon cohorts. Are you with me? Then he moves on down. He says that we would receive the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Everybody say, I got an inheritance. Listen, that is taking care of your physical, your spiritual, your financial, your home, your marriage, your children, your whatever. God's inheritance covers it all. I don't have time to go into all this. We'll do it next week. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? To us who believe according to the work of that mighty power that was wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. How many of you believe that? Come on, I want, you, I want to see hands. I want you to stand up on your feet. Close your Bible. Stand up on your feet. I, you, you say, I believe that Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost raised him to life again. I want you to raise your hand. You accept that as true. That is the greatest revelation you could ever have in your heart. Because when you understand that, then the Christ of unsearchable riches that dwells inside of your spirit is absolutely impossible to defeat him. All we've got to do is learn how to get on board with that. We'll do that next week. We'll talk about that more next week. But I'm telling you this. Satan had a panic attack whenever Paul began to get these revelations from God. Now, what I'm telling you right now is his grace is my strength. Paul said the Lord told him after three times of coming to the Lord, the Lord said, Paul, my grace is all you need. See, by grace you're saved through faith. By grace you're healed through faith. Now, when that just becomes a revelation, you're just about one of those believers that's going to start changing things around you. Why? Because it'll cause a revolution, and a revolution causes others to want to be on board with it. Nobody wants old dead, stale religion anymore. The secret church has gone the opposite direction and said, well, we need to look like the world and act like the world so we can get the world. The problem is, when they get the world in there, they don't change anything. So there's no revolution happening. They've lost their conviction. But I'm here to tell you, our job, no matter how big this church ever gets or what it ever does, is to not let that happen. We're going forward. Amen?